All right, well, I am really excited. I've been uh, preparing for the beginning of a brand new series, which we're starting today in the book of Ephesians for quite a while. And this is probably my favorite epistle in the entire Bible. This is a wonderful letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. And for the next 14 weeks, church, we are going to hunker down in Ephesians. So what I would encourage you to do is to get out your Bibles and just start reading through this letter to the Ephesians. Read it in different translations of the Bible. Look for words and phrases that jump out at you and write them down and, and ask the Spirit to breathe upon the Word of God so that this won't just be a, an exchange of information, but that God would be bringing a transformation in all of our lives as we jump into this book. There are six chapters. There are 155 verses. If you are a fast reader, you can read this little book in about 20 minutes. That's not me. I'm not a fast reader. But it would take a lifetime to mine the riches of this incredible letter to the Ephesians. I know someone who has spent their life reading and studying this and continues to study the Ephesians as their primary pursuit in life. And the things that the Apostle Paul reveals in this letter to the Ephesians that come from the heart of God have the power to change your life. And, and I'm not just overhyping that as like a used car salesman. I'm saying that it has the power to change your life and your understanding of your identity in Christ and what this thing is that we call the church that's so much deeper and more meaningful than you can even comprehend. And even how the gospel impacts your everyday life and your parenting and your relationships and in your work and in your marriage. Ephesians has all of that in it. And God wants to speak to us through this beautiful, short book. There's a theologian, his name is Klein Snodgrass, and he said this about Ephesians. He said, pound for pound, Ephesians may well be the most influential document in all of history. I don't disagree with that at all. John Calvin said that this was his favorite epistle by a long shot. I think if Jesus had written an, a, an epistle or a letter in the New Testament, Ephesians would have been the letter that Jesus would have written for two reasons. One, because it is theologically deep and rich and Second of all, because it's incredibly practical. All of it comes back to who is Jesus and who are we in Christ? And it's easy to break down this letter into uh, sections because of that. In chapters one through three, in the first half of Ephesians, Paul is exploring the story of the gospel and what God has done in Christ to form this new multi-ethnic community and so he begins talking about our identity. And then he connects it all with this word, therefore. And in chapters four through six, he's talking about how we as a community are to live out the story of the gospel in our everyday lives. See, Paul wasn't just head knowledge theoretical, but he was practical and he connected the dots. And that's why I believe that this letter is going to be such a, a blessing to us as a church as we mine its riches and look at how God wants to change our lives. And do you know how God changes our lives? He changes our perspective. How many of you enjoy just getting away, getting up in the air if, if you like to fly, traveling somewhere different? I know when I go up on the mountain on Skyline Drive and I look down on the valley and just the perspective of how small my house is and, right? And, and, and God, what are you want to do with my life. I can see that my life is just a small piece of a larger picture. Sometimes going away on vacation does that for me. I don't know about you. But God wants to give us a change in our perspective. And that is exactly what Ephesians is attempting to do in our life. See, perspective is a power, powerful thing because it's not about what we see, but it's the way we see what we see, right? Perspective isn't about what we hear, but it's the way that we hear what we hear. It's about our understanding of what's happening to us and around us. And this is where Ephesians, I believe, is 
so powerful in that the Apostle Paul wanted to give the Christians that he was writing to a right perspective about the gospel and what it meant for their life. And look, he was writing to a church that was split not in a a negative way at the time that he was writing, but it had Jewish followers of Jesus who had come to see that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. And it had Gentiles and people who had come out of crazy backgrounds and they were worshiping Jesus together in one community. And the apostle Paul was trying to say, here's how you need to see yourselves now. You need to see yourselves in Christ as your primary identity. Don't let secondary issues disturb you and break you down and pull you apart. How many of you know that secondary issues often have that ability in our lives and in the church and in our relationships, right? So Paul's pushing them back to the center. It's in Christ. Stay anchored in him. And he does that by trying to change and give them a right perspective. And he does that by taking them up to 30,000 feet and showing them all that they have in Christ. You know, in the New Testament, there are three books that are written from what I would call a heavenly perspective. Do you know what those three books are in the New Testament? Revelation, Colossians, and Ephesians. First Corinthians is written from an earthly perspective. It's addressing earthly issues and relationships. These three books, and especially Ephesians, above all three of those, is written from a heavenly perspective. It's the highest revelation, I believe, in all of the New Testament. It's the Mount Everest of all of Paul's writing, his magnum opus of what he communicated to the church. And here's what, what we need to understand as we start this series, is that if you want to see your life in the church and all that God has done for you in Jesus Christ from the viewpoint of heaven, then you need to lift your eyes and you need to lift your perspective from a worldly and earthly perspective. How do you see yourself? Is it influenced from a heavenly perspective or is it influenced by the residue of an earthly perspective? Paul says that if you want your life to change, if you want to live the good life, the Christian life that Jesus died to give to you, then you need to come with him up to 30,000 feet so that you can see from a heavenly perspective, a heavenly viewpoint, all that you are, all that Christ is, all that you own and possess in Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I often need that change of perspective. I can easily get distracted and define my life and my purpose and my identity by how you see me or other people see me or what I want people to see. Does anyone else struggle with constructing their identity on places and in people other than in Christ? And this is the power and the potency of the letter of Ephesians And my hope and my prayer for us as we start this is that we would allow God to change our perspective of who he is and who we are in him. And I believe that the transformation that God wants to bring in your life will come in and through that perspective change. It's why the Apostle Paul prayed these words in the first chapter of Ephesians. He said, my prayer for you is that the eyes of your heart, that your perspective may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Can we pray? Father, thank you for the words of scripture. Thank you for this letter to the Ephesians. We know that your spirit has breathed upon these words and we pray that you would change our perspective this morning and in the weeks to come, that you would deepen our understanding of the riches that we have in Christ, that you would help us to see the beauty of
of this thing called the church and its purpose, that you would help us to see that every part of our lives is to be lived from the reality of the gospel. God, we ask that you would open the eyes of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open them or turn them on and turn with me this morning to Ephesians chapter one. We're gonna be reading this morning in verses one through 14, and the scope of our time together this morning will be to look at verses one and two, and then I'm going to give us an introduction into the background of this letter It's an ambitious undertaking for this morning, so I ask that you'd be gracious and patient with me. I'm trying to pack uh, two suitcases into one here, and uh, we're going to learn all that the Holy Spirit has for us this morning from the epistle of Ephesians. I'm reading from the NIV. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord, church. Thanks be to God. I don't know if you picked up on it as we were reading that lengthy portion of text there, but in those 14 verses, there was a statement that kept recurring over and over. And it was the statement, in Christ or in him. 11 times, Paul used that statement in 14 verses. And that's because this idea of being in Christ was a really big part of Paul's theology. Because for Paul, who we are in Christ shapes our purpose and why we're sent to live in this world. And I want you to look with me again now at verse 1 and 2, and I want to read it together. Would you read this aloud? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a very typical Pauline introduction or greeting where Paul's letting his audience know that he is not sending himself. He's not a self-proclaimed prophet, but that he was made an apostle because of the divine will and the calling of God. And over and over in these verses we just read in verse 1 and 5 and 9 and 11, Paul speaks about this reality of the will of God. And in his case, the will of God was connected to the fact that God chased Paul down. God caught up to Paul. He was the most unlikely of candidates to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was one of the most unlikely of people to be used in the early church. If you know his story, you know that he persecuted the church with great joy. He hunted them down. He hated believers of the way. 
He was what we would refer to as a religious terrorist. But he tells us that it was the will of God to use him for his divine purposes. And God chased Paul down. And Paul said, I can't even believe that I'm here. I am the most unlikely of all candidates. I don't deserve anything but God's judgment, but God has extended to me his grace and he's given through his will a purpose to my life. And he's chased me down and I know it and I'm living in the reality of that calling as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that God, by his will, chased you down? That he didn't give up on you? That he relentlessly pursued you? And you might be here today living in sin or living apart from God, and let me tell you that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. He's chasing you down. He's knocking on the door, just as he did for the apostle Paul. The apostle Paul said, here I am by God's will, and I'm writing to all of you, to the saints who are in Ephesus. How many of you feel like a saint today? I don't feel like a saint today. Yesterday, I coached a soccer game, and we lost brilliantly. And I went home, and for about five hours, I sulked around because my inner world, (laughs) even though I didn't express it outwardly, I was not resting in my identity as a saint. (laughs) Amen. Our kids played their hearts out. But there was something going on with me, and I went home, and I just felt terrible for hours and hours, even into this morning when I woke up. And I realized that I had not been, and I am not even now, Existing in the reality of who I am as a saint. Does saint mean that I'm perfect? Is anyone here perfect? I'm not perfect. But saint isn't about being perfect. It's about being set apart. It's about being holy. It's about an identity that's been given to you because of Jesus Christ that you don't deserve. And the good news is that he is perfecting you in your saintliness. So we can look at each other, we can say, you may not feel like a saint, you may not have acted like a saint, but you are a saint, and God is working and perfecting you. And see, that's what the Apostle Paul was speaking into their lives. How many of you, we just need people in our lives to remind us of that truth, right? We need to greet each other that way. Hey, saints, son, brother, sister of the Most High God, holy one. I don't know, maybe, maybe if someone would have said that to you this morning, it would have just, it would have healed something in your heart or in your mind. The Apostle Paul was speaking these words to this church by the influence of the Holy Spirit. And he was saying, you are saints. You have been given this identity that is found in Christ. So don't go looking for it somewhere else. Man, it's so easy to look for our identities other places, isn't it? It's so easy to look for substitutes. But there's no life, there's no purpose, there's nothing sustainable in any of those pursuits. It's only in Christ that we find our reason for being and our hope for life. There's a theologian, his name is Peter O'Brien, and he says that Ephesians does not provide all of us with a list of rules to follow, nor does it suggest slick and easy solutions to our fundamental needs before God and others. Boy, if we had one of those, that would be great. But instead, on the basis of our union with Christ and our relationship with God, the letter urges us to change our inner being and character in a radical way. Every aspect of our lives is now to be lived with reference to our Lord. What's my north star in my life? How am I making decisions? How am I looking at my spouse or my children or the people who offend me? I'm looking at them through the reference of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know them any longer according to the flesh, according to their history or their past, and I got a lot on some of them, right? But I know them now according to their identity as saints of the Most High God. See, this is... This is the oil 
that runs and lubricates the engine of the church, right? This is what keeps us from having breakdowns in our engine as the body of Christ. It's when we choose to see ourselves in our identity as saints, and we extend that same gracious gift to those around us. They might be having a bad day today. I'm not sure why they said that to me. They're a Christian. Jesus would say, love is not easily offended. Forgive them. Yeah, but I'm going to hold a grudge. Yeah, but they're a saint, Seth. They're a saint. Treat them in accordance with how I see them and with their identity. And this is what Paul was communicating to this little church as he was speaking them about being saints, about the perfection that God was working in them, just as he's working in us in this journey that we are on as the Holy Spirit is healing us and transforming us and he's making us new in accordance with who God has predestined us to be in him. Thank God. Thank God for the words that Paul spoke to the Ephesians that he is speaking to our hearts this morning. And he ends in verse 2 with the words of grace. He says, I speak to you grace, unmerited favor of God, and the peace connected to the shalom of God that will bring true restoration and healing and wholeness in every aspect of your life. Grace and peace to you, my saints, brothers, and sisters. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, you are a saint of the Most High God. And yes, I did that just to make you uncomfortable. How did that feel? Awkward. (laughs) I can't believe we visited a church that does that. You are a saint, and I love you. And this letter is going to just intensify our love for one another. It's going to increase our love for our Savior. And I believe that for some of us, that this is going to realign our idea and our understanding of our identity that has been shaken and placed in so many other places for so long. And maybe it's This time that God's saying, I'm going to establish you by my word so that you can begin to live in the richness. Your life is a mess. Problems are not resolved. But as you come into an understanding of who you are and who I am, things in your life are going to change. We have just a little bit of time this morning together, and, and we're going to take a look at the background of this incredible letter together. I I feel like anytime you read something, understanding the context and why it was written, who it was written to, just helps us to uh, really explore and understand the truth that God wants to speak to our hearts in a deeper way. So if you have a pen or a pencil, this is part two of this message. I know this is kind of an odd way to do this, but we're going to talk for the rest of our time this morning about why Paul wrote this letter and what was happening in the background as the people received it. Paul was writing this letter near the end of his life. He was writing from a Roman, uh, he was writing while under Roman house arrest. He was speaking from his heart. Some people believe that Paul wrote Colossians and Ephesians, the two highest works that he wrote in the same day or in the same week. And so as he's writing this work and he's just writing from this place of 30,000 feet and seeing God's incredible eternal purpose and plan, he's communicating while from a place of persecution and suffering while under house arrest. This letter is what is often referred to as a circular letter because it was probably written to a number of churches. I know in the top of your Bible and in the first few words of verse 1, it says, to the saints, to the Ephesians, but there are many manuscripts that we have that are reliable. Without these words, in Ephesus, in the first line, 
of Paul's greeting leads many people and scholars to believe that this letter wasn't just written to the Ephesian church, but it was written to all the churches there in Asia Minor in a, in a wide area. Some of that, I believe, is for good reason, because if you read Ephesians, you'll see that there really aren't any personal greetings that Paul conveys in the letter. In a lot of his letters, he's writing, hey, give a shout out to this person and tell that person thanks for letting me borrow their sandals, and, right? But there's no personal messages of any sort here in Ephesus, other than about Tychicus, I can't even say that word, who brought the letter to the churches. We also don't see that Paul addresses any specific issues that are happening in the church. There's no negative reason for Paul's writing. He's just writing this letter to the churches, and I think that this was, in fact, written to a wide audience of the churches. And what happened is that because Ephesus was the primary church, the main church in Asia Minor, that it was delivered there, copies were made. And as copies were sent out along the way, someone just began writing in there to the church in Ephesus. Now, I may be wrong. It doesn't matter at some point. But I believe that the takeaway for this is that this letter is incredibly relevant for us, because we are the saints at Greenmont. And so you could remove the words to the saints in Ephesus, and you could insert to the saints at Greenmont. How much better is that, right? And so we received this letter with the understanding that it was written to a wide audience, but especially written to us. And really, this letter could have been written to all the same challenges and issues that you and I face on a day-to-day level in our lives. Now, Ephesus, where Paul was writing this potentially to, was a very important city within the Roman Empire. It was located at the entrance to Asia Minor. It was kind of like the New York City of its day, the harbor that everyone came in and through. And we know from Scripture that Paul had wanted to come to Asia. He had set his sights on Ephesus long before he'd ever arrived there. Two years before his trip there, he and Silas were planning to travel, and Acts 16 tells us they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So instead of going to Asia, they traveled around to other places. They eventually ended up in Corinth where Paul ministered for 18 months, and then at some point he packed up all of his belongings, and he made some good friends there, a couple named Aquila and Priscilla, who were tent makers just like Paul. And they said, Paul, yo, we're going to be going down to Ephesus. We're going to set up our business there, and the Lord's calling us there. We're going to do some ministry. And Paul said, okay, I'm coming along. And so Paul journeyed with Aquila and Priscilla, and his first trip to Ephesus we find in Acts chapter 18. And it says that they stopped at the port of Ephesus, where Paul left the others behind. And while he was there, he went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews. And so they asked him to stay longer, but he declined. How long was he there? We don't exactly know, but it was a brief stay. But we do know in Acts chapter 19 that Paul returns to Ephesus, and he stays for over two years. This is the longest stay of any ministry stop that Paul had in all of his ministry in Ephesus. We read these words in chapter 19 of Acts. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them? No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied, and there were about 12 men there in all. So most likely these 12 men that Paul met in Ephesus were Jews, who at one point, 20 years before, had traveled to Jerusalem probably for one of the feasts that they were to celebrate as Jewish men. And when they were there, they heard about this guy out in the wilderness baptizing people at the Jordan River named John. He was crazy, and they're like, let's just go check this guy out. 
So these men from Ephesus, as a group, traveled down probably to the Jordan. They heard John preach about repentance, and then they went home. And here is Paul following up with them and saying, guys, there's more to this story than just the repentance that John spoke about. And on that day, they put their trust in Jesus to forgive their sins. They were born again. They were filled with the Spirit, and they spoke in tongues. How's that for one day? And aren't there people like this all around us, church? There are people just like these 12 guys. Maybe they grew up in the church. Maybe they they heard a part of the gospel message. Maybe they have an incomplete picture. Or they don't understand that it's not by good works that they get to heaven, but it's because of Jesus. They're open. Maybe they're hungry. But no one has ever shared the whole story of the good news of Jesus with them in a way that makes sense. And I bet that we sit beside people like this at work and at basketball games. These people are in our families, and they have an understanding of some sort. They have a desire that goes with it about maybe being good enough as a prescription to get to heaven, but they haven't heard the whole story. They haven't experienced Jesus' love. And I think that God has placed you and I just as he put Paul there on that day, to be aware of these people who are around us. Maybe they're even coming to your mind right now. Maybe they're moralistic people, good people. They live a good life. They don't bother anyone. But this piece is missing, that they're not getting to heaven on their own merits or their own good works, but it's only through trusting in Christ. Amen? And so God is sending you and me to tell them the rest of the story. Thank you, Paul Harvey. Everyone under the age of 50 knows who I'm talking about. And Acts tells us that immediately after Paul had this encounter with these 12 guys, that he entered the synagogue and he spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate, and they refused to believe, and they publicly maligned the way, so that Paul left them. He took the disciples that he had with him, and he went down the street and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this went on for two years. Now, if you know Paul's way of operating, you know that when he would roll into a new city, he would go and find in the phone book where the local synagogue was, and he would go and visit. And he would begin teaching there and helping the Jewish people to connect the dots between their scriptures and the arrival of their Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. And Paul would be met with all different kinds of responses by the people in the synagogues. And here we find out that after three months, they got really tired of Paul and they kicked him to the curb. And Paul said, all right, I've tried to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. So Paul goes down the road and finds a guy who obviously was not a good public speaker because he couldn't draw enough people to keep his lecture hall in business. And Paul said, no problem, I'll rent it from you. And there Paul met daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Now, I've read some background on this, and it's fascinating. Ephesus was a very hot place, terribly hot. And so Paul would wake up in the morning, and he would work from 7 until 11 in the morning, doing his trade as a tent maker, just like everyone else. And then from 11 to 4, people would typically go home and take a nap. How many of you would like that schedule? I remember when I lived in Mexico, that was our schedule. I love that schedule. But instead of going home to take a nap, Paul rolled into the lecture hall, and he taught from 11 to 4. And guess what? It wasn't empty. People weren't going home to take naps because Paul was bringing the good stuff. People began to hear about this guy named Paul, and he became incredibly popular in the city of Ephesus. And we read in verse 10 that this teaching rotation that he was a part of went on for two years so that all the Jews and all the Greeks who lived in the entire province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Is that not amazing, church? Everyone who lived within this entire region heard the word of the Lord in less than three years' time. 
And this is without YouTube or podcasts. Imagine what Paul could have done if he would have had a podcast. And just to give you an idea of how big of a region this is, we're not just talking Augusta County or Virginia. This is the region that basically includes all of modern-day Turkey. And we're told that everybody in three years or less heard the word of the Lord because Paul was lighting it up every day. The church was blowing up. God was doing a powerful thing in Ephesus through the impact of one man. Oh, I just want to preach there. How many of you know that when one person does what we're supposed to be doing with all of our heart, we're fully surrendered to the Lord. I'm sure Paul wanted to take a nap and he's like, let me just take off today. I'm losing my voice. I'm tired. I had a, I didn't, I have indigestion. Most people would tap out and go home and Paul's like, I'm going to the lecture hall. And God, through the ongoing daily sowing of the seed of the gospel through Paul's ministry, just changed this entire region. How much can he do through your one life? Fully given to him, putting to death the flesh each day, saying, God, here I am indigestion, tiredness, whatever it is. I'm fully yours, God. You can use my one life. See, we might be talking about you and the impact on the map of your life in three years for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so people would travel here to Ephesus for vacation and business and worship. They'd hear the gospel, and then they'd take it back into the interior or other places and share with their family and friends their testimony. And God blessed this ministry. It's not much different than the ministry that you have when you share your testimony. Last week, we had a number of people just share little snip, snippets, snapshots of the gospel at work in their life. The way that they are being faithful and hanging on and the way that God is showing up. Do you know that that's what the world needs to hear? Your teeny little testimony. Your little admission of my weakness and God's strength. That's what the world needs to hear to turn it upside down. And Paul was having an impact church of all places here in Ephesus. Now, I already mentioned that Ephesus was a port city. It was located, as you can see, it had this amazing harbor. And you could just get scoot right on out to the ocean, scoot right on in. And so this place was bustling with people and trade and all kinds of things. This was the fourth largest city in the entire Roman Empire. 250,000 people, which seems small to us, but it was like a megalopolis at that time. Here was Paul in this place that was large. It was wealthy. Archaeologists have done excavations in the city and found that there were paved roads, and some of them were paved in marble. Man, they need to send a note to VDOT about that. Fill up some of our potholes with marble. And they found in some of their excavational digs that people's homes had gems, precious gems that were inlaid in their floors. And this was just the kind of city where everybody had cash and they were rolling in it and they had money to burn. And here was Paul smack dab in the middle of this city. And it would have been a city that I would have loved. And I know Bob would have loved because it was a sports crazed city, like Philadelphia. They had their own uh, 25,000 seat sports arena. It doesn't look like it now. But they would have Olympics and athletics, they would have gladiatorial games. And eventually, they even put the Christians in there with animals. It got bad. But they loved their athletics, just like we do. They also loved higher learning and education. They had a massive library, one of the largest in the world at the time, with over 12,000 scrolls. And it was home to a prestigious medical school that specialized in optometry. Why am I telling you all these things? I'm just letting you know about the kind of place that Paul was. It was a lot like a city that we would live in here. And all those things would have 
grabbed someone's attention. But you know what grabbed the Apostle Paul's attention when he was in Ephesus? It was the spiritual climate of the city. Paul could see beyond all these trappings of wealth and education that we're so often just oh, overwhelmed by. We're affluent, right? Our degrees and our money and our, the cars we drive. And Paul's like, none of that matters, guys. It's all going to burn. Paul could see to the heart of the issue what was happening here in Ephesus. And he saw that people were dying and they were on their way to hell because they did not know Jesus. And they had a lot of good intentions. And they were very religious people. This was like the religious epicenter of all of the Roman Empire. It was a melting pot of cultures and religions. This was a city where you could walk down the street and you could find a wizard. You could find a sorcerer, a witch, an astrologer, a fortune teller. They were everywhere. They had hung their shingles all over the city. Archaeologists, archaeologists have discovered there were at least 50 different deities that were worshipped in Ephesus. But of all of the worship that went on, none of it compared to the worship of the goddess Artemis. She was the one who demanded the worship of the people of Ephesus. And people would travel from all over the world to worship her. The Romans referred to her as Diana. And she had a temple, as was often built, and they would build these up on the high places, on a hill overlooking the city. And this was one of the seven wonders of the world at the time. It dominated the skyline. It was 425 feet long by 200 feet by 60 feet high. And it had 127 pillars that supported it that were all covered in gold and studded with jewels. Where do you think that their affection and their heart was as a people. It was in the worship of Artemis. And every year, people would flock here from all over the world for a month-long celebration and worship of Artemis. She was the goddess of fertility, which means that the worship of Artemis included some of the most vile sexual immorality, unspeakable things. Archaeologists uncovered just down the road from her temple that there was a large brothel. This influenced and set the flavor for the entire life of the city, just like many of the cities that we live in today. It was sexually charged. It was a dark place. And yet the light of the gospel was breaking into this city in a way that was just changing people's lives. It was impacting people's livelihoods. We're told of a story later of a, a guild of people who used to make little trinkets and figurines in the shape of these gods and goddesses. And they said, Paul's preaching is hurting our bottom line. We got to get rid of him. Everybody's going to turn to Jesus and we won't have a business anymore. See, this is what happens when the gospel begins to change a city, begins to change a nation. That the values things that the nation worships, the things that the nation and the people that they aspire to, that they begin to change as Jesus becomes greater and lifted in the eyes of the people. And that was what was happening in this multicultural city in Ephesus. People were getting healed and set free, and the devil wasn't happy about it. In Acts chapter 19, verse 11, it said, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that, touched, that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. See, when the gospel goes, if you read the, the ministry of Jesus, when the gospel goes, there are often explosions of God's power in miraculous ways that go with the preaching of the gospel. There are modern stories of this and unreached places. We don't see it in America, right? Sometimes we say, but the power of God is still very real. I'm not trying to manufacture that. If God wants to, to empower or work through one of us with power of healings and miracles, deliverances, he can do that. But we see that it was happening here in conjunction with the preaching of the gospel. And there's a very interesting story about what that looked like 
there was a Jewish family. There were these seven Jewish guys who went around trying to cast out demons, the Bible tells us, in Ephesus, and they weren't having a lot of success. So they tried to drive out an evil spirit by saying, okay, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out. Because it was working when Paul did it. And the demon said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but I don't know any of you guys. The Bible says that the demon-possessed man jumped on these seven guys. He beat them down like a UFC cage match. And they ran out of the house naked and bleeding down the street. And the Bible says in verse 17, when this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. And many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. And in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. When people see that there is a recognizable difference, a tangible difference between Jesus, the creator, the divine one, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, and these weak imitations that the devil concocts to to try to entice people and lead them into bondage, people begin to get set free. Jesus was here pushing around the spiritual powers of darkness. And people took notice that there was another sheriff that was in town. And what amazes me is that when they saw what was happening, they brought all their secret stash of stuff that they had been holding on to. Maybe Jesus isn't all that we thought that he was. We came to faith in him, but we're going to just hold some of these things back in our life. We're going to put them under the bed, keep them in the closet, just in case God isn't all who he said he was. And when they saw the power of God at work, and the demands that Jesus had placed on their lives for worship, they went and they brought their things and they burned them. And do you know that the value of these items was over $6 million? These were, I believe, many of them, new believers in Christ or Christians who had held these things back in their life. Oh, my porn stash, right? My OnlyFans account, right? All these things that we try to hide from God. All of these sinful areas of our lives. And they said, I didn't realize who I was dealing with. And they came and they threw them on the fire. I remember when I was in high school, there was a revival happening in my high school. And I remember hearing about a gathering one evening of a bunch of the guys. And they brought all of their CDs of all their nasty, terrible music. CDs, guys, are like MP3s on a disc. They brought all their CDs and they brought all their porn magazines. And they threw them in the fire. And they said, God, here we are. We're setting ourselves apart. We're repenting for all the secret things that we've been holding on to in our lives. God, we're going all in. We're not going to live lukewarm lives for you any longer. Guys, how many of us have those places in our lives that are secret, that we hold on to, that are things that are of the earth, that are worldly, and we just think, well, it won't really affect anything that much. And there's a moment when God invites us and calls us to see his greatness and his power, and he wants us to know that I want to unleash that in your life, but you need to get real with me. You need to bring some things to the fire. You need to offer them up and burn them so that you can walk in the fullness of all that I have for you in your life. We're going to come to the table here in just a moment. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. But church, this pursuit over the next 14 weeks in the letter to the Ephesians is going to be God calling us higher, God helping to change our perspective. Some of you need a massive perspective change. Some of you have been living in the dregs of what someone else has said about you. 
pain of your past, the wounds from your life that have defined you, and this word says that you are someone altogether different. And I pray that Jesus would begin to open the eyes of your heart, that you would see him and you would see yourself. I pray for those of you who have been in bondage to sin, secret sin, that Jesus would become so great in your eyes, his power, his love, his purpose for your life, that you would leave those things behind, that you would throw them on the fire and deal with them once and for all so that you can walk in the freedom and the fullness of who he's called you to be.